there's two lives that a lot of times in the Christian uh, walk, there's two lives that are being attempted to be lived. And Mr. Adaman and I were talking not terribly long back, and he brought this up. He said, you know, there's the problem with, with a lot of Christians is they're trying to live two lives, and it's not possible. It's a, a conflicting lifestyle. They, it causes a disastrous or chaotic walk. And I want to show you that, and especially with hip, uh, hypocrisy that's not only outside the church, but it's really penetrated within the walls of churches today, and I'll show you that. So again, Luke chapter 12, starting at verse 1, it says, Under these circumstances, after so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were stepping on one another, he began saying to his disciples, First of all, beware of the leaven of Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. But there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed upon the housetops. So start out by saying hypocrisy for the Christian is a sense of false security. Because hypocrisy by its very own definition includes the appearance of what would be called uh, religiosity or, or, or a strong sense of religion. And because of that, there is a grave danger for the Christian of false security. See, we, become to, we come to this point a lot of times to believe in our religious trappings um, people presume we're religious long enough that we come to totally believe it ourselves. Any doubts will slowly shrink away as we are able to successfully maintain the appearance or the idea of being a good Christian. And this is a very day, and I'll explain this in a minute, but it's a very dangerous place to be. In fact, we'd probably be better off to be in an obvious sinful lifestyle than to be in a lifestyle of trying to portray being a good Christian or this hypocrisy lifestyle. And the reason is because if you're in an obvious sinful lifestyle, then the likelihood of conviction is uh, greater. It's greater. Jesus spoke to how the religious leaders were less likely to come into the kingdom than the prostitutes and the tax collectors. And a big reason was because of what I just said. The, the latter knew that they needed to repent. The prostitutes and the tax collectors those times knew that they needed repentance. They needed to turn, in other words, from that lifestyle and head towards Christ, right? A big reason um, for those that live in this hypocritical lifestyle is they never admit that. They never feel the sense of repentance. So that's why I say I believe it's, it's greater to just be in a sinful lifestyle because the conviction will become so great that you know what you need, but being in a hypocritical walk, you don't recognize it. You don't admit it. You want to portray an outer look of being a good Christian. Um, you're, you're too convinced of your own righteousness or religiousness than to see what you really need. Uh, for the non-Christian, it's the delusionment that happens when you look closely at Christians' lives. Christian hypocrisy is damaging to non-believers as well. Perhaps they get interested enough to move a step or two towards God only to be knocked backwards by what they see. They get up the courage to actually finally come to church, and I've seen this too many years, that they finally get the courage up to walk through the walls of church only to find people that are just wandering around going through uh, pointless rituals in their mind. Or they start to pray only to have the biggest quote-unquote Christian in their office do something that's completely immoral or unethical. Or they start thinking about believing in God. That's a start, right? 
before the gospel, only to find that the preacher that they're sitting and listening to is more interested in what they can give rather than their souls. So it's damaging to unbelievers as well. I've found through years of doing ministry that one of the biggest things that holding people back from pursuing God is Christians. Rarely do people bring up theology. Rarely do unbelievers want to discuss or, or talk about their doubts in the truthfulness of the Bible. Rarely do those unbelievers talk about uh, how finding a Jesus that's resurrected implausible. But often, unbelievers through years of doing ministry will begin to tell me a story about the Christians that they know. Now, it's not for me. Let me tell you about the Christians that I've met. They say they're Christians. They say they're good people, and yet yeah, I see them doing these things away from church. So it has a very damaging effect to not only believers, but unbelievers as well. This is a major reason why we have so many young people walking away from their faith. They come to church while their parents make them in grade school and middle school and high school. But yet when they're there, they often feel like their opinions don't matter or they aren't fully able to articulate the, the inad in inadequacies of what they see going on around them. So as they get older, they start to recognize hip hypocrites and they, they walk away from it. They leave. They see that the... Now, I'm not talking about here, right? We're perfect here. <laughs> they see that the preacher is saying Jesus is the most important thing in the world, but everyone is living for the American dream. They see that the church says that God answers prayers, but they never try anything that requires Him to show up. They see that sermons say that Jesus saves and changes lives, but everyone around them still looks and acts the same. And so after seeing all this, they walk away. Undoubtedly, some would walk away no matter how on fire for God we might be, but just as certainly, many more would continue to walk with God if they'd see a passionate faith modeled by us. So how big of a problem is hypocrisy today? Hypocrisy is all about the image over substance that we are facing in this social media generation. In Luke 12, 1, it talks about the leaven of the Pharisees or yeast, right, of the Pharisees. We are a generation in a society that is perhaps more than any other era in history that is focused on image. We have that luxury because of Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and TikTok and blah, blah, and so on and so on, right? We have all of these online social media entities that allow us the opportunities to shape and create our public image. It's amazing how much Stuff you see on, on Facebook, for instance, and, and of course, and the others that I mentioned as well. But you see all these people's profiles and everything that they post and everything looks wonderful about themselves. Now, they'll be the first to get on there and blast a ex-spouse or something. You know, let me tell you what he did or let me tell you what she did. But when it comes to themselves, they paint this picture of this perfect person that they want to be or that they want you to think that they are. And see, you can do that in this era of social media. Jesus in verse 1 calls hypocrisy the leaven of the Pharisees or the yeast of the Pharisees. What does that mean? Well, like I told the young group last week, what does yeast do in bread? It puffs it up. It rises. It puffs it up. It puffs up what you got and it makes it bigger and fuller than what you had originally. 
The idea of puffing up is a pretty good analogy for Facebook profiles and Snapchat profiles and so on that a lot of you guys and those that you know have. It's not a place where we want to tell people exactly who we are and the struggles that we're facing and the, the, the times that we fall and fail, but yet we paint it as a pretty picture of puffing ourselves up so that the outside sees something that we truly aren't. I gave the example last week, and you may remember the story, when Tiger Woods was at the pinnacle of golf. I mean, he couldn't be beat, it looked like. And then we had the scandals. All the stuff that he was involved in with the uh, adultery, multiple adultery cases and things, and all the, the chaos between him and his ex-wife. I remember seeing, you can go back and you can look up articles, by the way. Pretty cool, internet gives you that ability. But never once did you see, unless it was a Christian type deal, but in the, in the real uh, out there media and, and the, I guess the, the primetime shows, never talked once about what he needs help-wise to fix himself within. But yet they all talked about, well, this is hurting his image. What is this going to do to his image? What is this going to do to his, the image of golf? What is this going to do to the brand of Tiger Woods? That was the word that you would read constantly. You would see image and you would see brand. But yet you never saw what it, the struggles that were really going on within him and how people cared more about that. That's where we are today. There's a danger of becoming more focused on looking like we're living this good life than in actually living a good life. There's a danger of becoming more focused on how we present ourselves than how we really are. We need to focus on more on what it is and less on what it looks like. This should demand that when you find hypocrisy in your life that you deal with it. It's much easier to just ask whether the issue is going to affect your image. That's, that's not the main question. The main question is whether you're becoming who you need to be and who God wants you to be. One reason that hypocrisy is so prevalent is that it's significantly easier to maintain an image than to actually change how you live. Don't look away in the moment of truth. God will help you change things in your life. Sometimes we cover up because we're sure that God will reject us if what we're doing comes to light. God already knows about it. You know, you tell your kids when they're little, look, everything you do, God knows. It's kind of like Mr. Adam brought up Jonah. Jonah is, thinks that he can run away but yet God knew exactly where he was. I, I, little people kill me how they're like young people, they'll tell you, well, I don't want God to see it. <laughs> so why are you under your bed? I don't want God to find me. God sees it. You tell them when they're young, God sees it. Well, guess what? You tell them when they're old too. God sees it. God sees it. Bring it to him with a desire to change your life. And He will eagerly meet you there. He wants that sin gone from your life as well. It's kind of like a father that if a son or daughter caught up in an addictive lifestyle comes to you and says, Dad, I want you to help me get clean. A father, a good father is going to eagerly jump on that opportunity, aren't they? That's how God does. It's what he's waiting on. Well, is this a problem for the church in America? It's a huge problem. The American church is a powerless shell. It is in large part because the American church is hypocritical. God knows it, and he will not deal with it lightly. 
We talk a lot about image and marketing in churches today, but not, a much, not enough about prayer. So how do we avoid this hypocrisy in our life? First thing, don't judge your life solely on the outward results. In, Luke, in our first verse, it says, when a crowd of many thousands have gathered, right? See, these words come in the midst of a great what is an outward success. When you look at it and you say, look, if you stand up here, the more people you see, it looks like an outward success, right? Jesus in those times was drawing massive crowds. But what we know is every time these massive crowds would gather, he would dip. Why? Because he wasn't impressed. The outward huge crowd, what it looked like to many, oh look, look at this crowd he drew, didn't impress him. The numbers didn't impress him. He knows that the presence of the crowds does not indicate success, just as the eventual lack of crowds also does not indicate failure. His goal is to remain obedient to his Father's will, no matter what the outward results were. It's, a wonderful, it's wonderful when things are going well, but that's not always an ironclad proof that we're where we need to be. Just because things are going smoothly doesn't mean that it's where you need to be. We think it because uh, we think it is because often we believe that God's job in our lives is to make our lives easy <laughs> and bless our socks off, right? It's not, despite what we want to think. His goal is to make us like Christ. To make, it like, make us like Christ. That is why sometimes the path He leads us down requires sacrifice. And as Mr. Adam talked about first half, suffering and struggle. When those things happen, that's not necessarily a sign we're off track. We might be right in the center of God's will for our life. Live a life where the inside matches the outside. Live a life where the reality matches the perception. Second thing, know that the road towards hypocrisy goes downhill. Also in verse 1 it says, be on guard. Be on guard or beware in the New American Standard. Be on guard. He tells us to be on guard because the road of hypocrisy runs downhill. You don't have to make a lot of extra efforts to get there. You want to get in shape, you're going to have to make, a ex make an extra effort to get to that point. i got a lot of people over here that work out more than me. I know it's not that obvious, but... <laughs> but they put a lot of hard work in to get to where they're at. It takes effort. It doesn't happen by accident. The Landons and the people like that didn't wake up one morning and go, wow, look at me. I accidentally fell when I was sleeping and now I'm huge. <laughs> if that was the case, I would make sure I fell every night. <laughs> you want to learn something, you have to put the effort in. But being a hypocrite comes easy. How easy it is to end up on the road to hypocrisy is evident in how many go down that road. It's a perennial problem. It's been a major issue throughout the history of church, and it was a big issue through the Old Testament as well. Here's a way you can you, you know that. Compare the num we're in the Bible Belt, right? The good old Bible. Compare the number of churches that you know and how many people fill those churches. I mean, just drop down. 411. Now, think about how many truly devoted, passionate believers that you know. That's a problem. I can, other than you, right? Outside of here, I can name just a handful of truly God obedient, 
Christ-seeking, passionate believers outside of you guys. But there are a lot of churches, and there's a lot of big churches, and they fill those pews at these big churches. So what that tells me is there's a lot of hypocrites. There's a lot of people that are caught up in outward image and not so concerned with who they are on the inside. It's always been a problem, and it continues to be a problem. Now we have social media and stuff like that to puff it. Third thing, hypocrisy thrives among the religious. It says the leaven of the Pharisees or the yeast of, of the Pharisees. This was a problem that the religious people had. And in this verse, the Pharisees were called out on it. If you claim to be a follower of God or Christ, this is something you have to watch out for. The danger here is that we we'll often take our cues about what it means to follow Christ and what following Christ looks like, not from the Bible, but what, from what we see going on around us. We see half-hearted devotion and we presume that that's all that God expects. He doesn't. He expects wholehearted devotion. We see prayers that no, have no expectations of any answer and we presume that that's all that God expects as long as we're praying. He does it. He wants us to pray with an eye out to watch Him move to answer that prayer. We see no one eager to see their lives shaped into being more Christ-like and we presume that God doesn't expect any more from us. No, He wants more. He wants to form us to be completely Christ-like. Romans 12, 2. He wants to conform us to being as close to Christ as we possibly will allow Him to mold us to. We have to look to the Bible to see what the vision is that God has for our lives. What does He intend? What does He expect in our daily walk? Often hypocrisy thrives among the religious because all we all collectively lower our standards and say that an image-based faith is all we need to have in 2023. What it looks like to others. Live Fourth thing, live as though everything is public because ultimately it is. Luke 12, 2 through 3. See, on the internet, and this, I shared this, and I'll share it with you guys. It's adults, so. On the internet, most browsers, in case you haven't figured this out, and you don't need to figure it out, but they have something that you can turn on that's called private browsing, right? And it's really another name. It should be really titled uh, porn mode. I mean, that's... Really, what? Because why else would they put it there? Let's be honest, right? It's uh, it's a a setting that you can turn on so that no one that has your computer can go back and see what websites you've been to. I mean, that's let's be honest. That's what it is. It's the chance to go places and no one knows where you've been. See, we all have moments in our lives that we presumed is being done in private living. We think things we shouldn't think, but it's okay because it's done in private. We do things we shouldn't do, but it's okay it's done in private. We say things we shouldn't say, but it's okay because it was done in private. For those of us, and it pretty much includes all of us, who think, do, and say things that we're presuming are going to remain private, then verses 2 and 3 should be horrifying. It says everything that is concealed is going to be revealed. He says that everything that is hidden will be made known, and everything that was said under the cover of darkness will be brought into the light. Everything that was whispered privately will be spoken publicly. Nothing is hidden. Those are horrifying thoughts for all of us. And I expect that's all of us who have done, said, and thought things that we presume were private. So what is this 
a reference to. Well, if you look at the final judgment, when we're judged, judgment seat of Christ, when we're judged, all that we've done is there. It's out, right? Everything that we do that we think we're... Now, it doesn't change our salvation, of course. But everything that we do as believers to put on this outward image that will create this false sense of who we are in Christ will be brought out to us. It will be brought out if it doesn't here on this earth. Nothing is being hidden. Nothing is going without God seeing it. Nothing is, is productive, being done productive if we're trying to live two lives. It can't be done. You continue to live as if the world is your God, but yet you come to church and live like you're the perfect good Christian. It is a chaotic, dangerous, dangerous hypocritical place to be. And let me tell you, the world is watching. The unbelievers are watching. We have a duty, like Paul, to spread the gospel in everywhere that we are. We have a duty to seek out God's will for our life. How do you do that? You study His Word and listen to Him and communicate with Him and allow Him to guide you where He wants you. Not where you want to be, but where He wants you to be. And when you're there, you have a duty to not only spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, but what? Make disciples of all the nations. And part of making disciples is saying, I'm going to make sure my outward life matches inside who I truly am so that the ones that I plan on discipling will see that I am who I say I am. And that they won't look at me and go, well, you know, Pastor Jeff is a wonderful person when he's preaching Jesus, but Lord Almighty, when we get away from that church, he is the meanest person I've ever met. Or he's out doing these things, but yet he talks about doing this in church. That's not making disciples. We have to change that. Because let me tell you, the church out there is not. It's getting worse. And Satan is using social media and things like this to puff up just as these Pharisees were puffed up. Stop. Stop. Be the same person within these walls. Be the same person within the shell that you are when they look at you. Or when you post something, avoid hypocritical lifestyle and it will be rewarding. That's how you make disciples. That's how you keep people desiring to come where you are at in your life. And then you can be like Paul and say, you know what? Imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's what you want. So. We'll close in prayer and then we'll say the pledge and get you out of here. Um, any more announcements? I know that we, Willie, what date was that? We're going to put it in the bulletin, uh, but August, Friday, August 25th. Friday, August 25th, we're going to feed the Moody football team. So be in prayer about that. And if you can help, uh, please let Willie, Rhonda, Willie, Rhonda know. And it's also going to be in the bulletin, so um, we'll make sure we get you more information about that. So um, let's pray, and, and then we'll stand and do the pledge. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for all those that, that are here today just to fellowship, study your word. Thank you for Mr. Adama and, and the message that you put on his heart. And uh, wow, just so much, so much that we have to be thankful for being a part of this church. We are so blessed when you see what the world is trying to teach people. We're so blessed to have someone that remains faithful year after year to teaching truth despite what society wants us to do. 
So we're so thankful for that. I pray for those that are unable to be here for whatever reason. Pray that you'll heal those that need healing, protect those that need protecting, and comfort those that need comforting. We love you. Of course, we always pay, pray for our, our military and our government and just that you'll they'll continue to seek you. If they haven't, they will seek you for guidance and wisdom. We love you. Praise you. Ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.